Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be around the world. Lovely to, to see you all. Um, if you wouldn't mind just muting yourselves and your accounts, that would be wonderful, just so we don't have any um, extemporaneous feedback. Uh, my name is Dr. Bowen Gilly. Uh, and I uh, work with the Klamak First Museum, uh, specifically in areas related to development. Um, this includes the application of grant funding. Uh, and I am also uh, the host of the speaker series. And it is my absolute delight today to be able to uh, welcome our guest speaker, Elizabeth Witten, who will be speaking about Dr. Clooney McPherson and the invention of the gas mask, which really revolutionized uh, the course of modern warfare. Earlier this year, we actually received a grant from the Royal Society, and in this grant, we were able to invite local school children from uh, Newton Moore to come to the museum where they learned about the gas masks from a lecturer at a local Scottish university. Um, and then at the end of this presentation, uh, they created their own gas masks, and these are on display at the museum. A, a good time was had by all, and if you are able to visit the museum or to visit our Instagram or Facebook accounts, uh, you can see pictures from this wonderful event. So we're delighted to have Elizabeth Witten here with us today. Um, she's writing to, a, or calling in rather, from uh, Canada, uh, based in St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, and uh, Labrador. At one point, she intended to become an academic, but decided instead to go into journalism. She attended the University of King's College in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where she graduated from its one-year Bachelor of Journalism program. From there, she worked as an assistant editor for Down Home Magazine and was a reporter for two years with the online business publication All Newfoundland and Labrador, where she covered the tech sector and healthcare. Now, as a freelance reporter, she covers municipal politics, healthcare, and arts, all while she's currently writing a book about the history of comic books made in her home province, as well as a biography on our very own Dr. Clooney McPherson. And this is the subject of her talk today. So again, we are delighted to welcome Elizabeth Witten uh, to the presentation. So Elizabeth, I, I turn control over to you. Uh, well, uh, again, uh, thank you all so much for tuning in on a Saturday. I don't know where you are all calling in from, but uh, it's a really beautiful day in St. John's here. It's the afternoon. But uh, again, thanks so much for taking time out of your day to sign up for this chat. And um, I hope you guys all stick around and have a, a wonderful time. Uh, I think it's also a really nice coincidence that we are talking about a gas mask, which is a mask, uh, a few days before Halloween. So um, I will ask Bo to go to the, the next slide. So uh, if you're walking down downtown St. John's, there's this beautiful park called Bannerman Park. And it's this 100-year-old park, and it, it's quite gorgeous. And on one side is a really popular street called Rennie's Mill Road. And these are this is a road filled with beautiful mansions. And they were basically the homes of the really rich and powerful in St. John's, uh, the creme de la creme, if you like. So um, if you're walking down this road, you will see a plaque. And this is the plaque I saw when I was a little girl walking down it on my way to the park. And it says, um, from the Newfoundland Historic Trust, Dr. Clooney McPherson, inventor of the gas mask, lived here. And this little nugget of information kind of stayed in the back of my head for, for decades, basically. And um, I, it was about five years ago, I started writing a, a book about him because I wanted to know how did a local doctor, a, a general practitioner, a family doctor, uh, get such a, such a claim to fame. And in my research, I've read his notebooks, some interviews, I've done research into the works of other people, and no one's really looked at the role Clooney played in World War I, and how he actually became involved in such a, a massive feat. Uh, we're talking about the first large-scale uh, chemical weapons attack, in, which happened in 1915. And my interest was immediately, well, how did that happen? So I'm going to, for the, the next little while, I'm going to walk you all through uh, how, who Clooney was and how we became involved in the war. So um, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> 
So um, in 1965, to mark the 50th anniversary of one, the first chemical, large scale chemical gas attack, and the invention of Clooney's gas mask, Clooney was interviewed by a local reporter with the Evening Telegram. And this is what the reporter Art Pratt had to say about Clooney's wartime experience. If a novel written as a wartime spy thriller were to chronicle some of the circumstances under which Dr. McPherson carried out his work when overseas, the thoughtful reader would regard it as exciting, but beyond the realm of probability. But in this case, the circumstances did exist in real truth and they are well documented. So that kind of gives you an idea of, you know, what Clooney's time at war would have been like. But I'm going to go a little back further from 1955 to when Clooney was born. So he was born in 1879 on March 18th to a very well-to-do Methodist family here in St. John's. He was the eldest of four children and they were all educated at the Methodist College, which was the local school at preparing its students for post-secondary education either in the US, Canada, and the UK. At the time, Newfoundland, a colony, did not have a university. We only got a college in 1925 or so, and it only became accredited university after Confederation. So uh, Clooney was really distinguished himself when he was a student there. Uh, he won numerous uh, academic prizes. And uh, if we go to the next slide, you will see a picture of young Clooney. Uh, he is in one of the striped shirts. He's in the very back corner, and he's the boy not looking at the camera. He's looking at the side, because I'm giving a side profile here. And um, this was taken in 1940, 19, sorry, not 19, 1894, and it was the first uh, year of the organized inter-college football championship, and the Methodist College team won that year. And this image is owned by the rooms, which is, so I have to give them credit for letting me use it. Um, so, uh, you know, Clooney was a really well-rounded student too. So he also, you know, did well in school and he also performed, you know, on the, on the, on the pitch as it were. So uh, Clooney, uh, oh, sorry, not go back to that slide, please. <laughs> right on. So um, Clooney's family were merchants. Uh, they were in the dry goods business rather than the fish merchants, which were really powerful in, in, in Newfoundland at the time. Uh, his pro family probably intended for him to take over the family business, which was the royal stores. After all, he was the eldest son. But uh, that did not happen. In 1892, we had the, what was called the Great Fire of 1892, and a good chunk of the city was burned down. And a few days after that Great Fire happened, uh, a, local, a doctor from England sailed through the harbor, and his name was uh, Dr. Grant Wilford Grenville. And he was just stopping by in the St. John's Port to uh, basically stock up and on his way to Labrador because he was a part of the Royal Mission to Deep Sea Fishermen, which was a charitable, charitable organization that operated in the North Sea. And they were considering setting up in Labrador. But meeting this doctor changed Clooney's life. He was supposedly going to become, you know, the president of his family's dry goods business. But after he saw this doctor, he decided he was going to become a doctor too. And uh, it's also important to, to know that Clooney lived through a, a really interesting time in, in Newfoundland's history. At the time, it was a colony, but Clooney would grow up to see it become a dominion and then a Canadian province. He saw streets that were once the community spaces shared by pedestrian and horses basically become the domain of the automobile. And as a great lover of gadgets, he was an early adopter of the automobile and was one of the first people in the city to get a car of his own. So um, Clooney was also uh, a fourth generation Newfoundlander uh, and he had very strong ties to Scotland. And later in life, he would become the chairman of the Clan McPherson Association and president of its Canadian branch. Um, I, from his family, I've been able to at least find uh, his Scottish roots was a, a man named Alexander McPherson who was a skipper sailing out of Greenwich. And his son, Peter, immigrated to uh, a community outside St. John's, about 100 kilometers away in 1804. And he was there as an agent of the British House of Bain Johnson. So uh, just a, a, almost a customs kind of situation. But his descendants would go on to start the Royal Stores, which was around until the 1970s. So Clooney was poised to kind of take this over, but again, he meets a, a doctor 
who was a, a, a missionary medical situation. Uh, Grenfell was there basically to, you know, help the people up in Labrador. And so Clooney now graduates from medical, from me the Methodist College, and he goes to McGill University in, up in Montreal, and he graduates in 1901. He spends about a year in Europe doing postgraduate study, and then he returns home. And the Newfoundland government actually asks him to go up to Labrador and help contain a smallpox epidemic. And he was even made a justice of the peace to kind of give his orders a bit more legal weight. It's one thing to go up and inoculate people, but it's another for ha to have people basically say, you know, you know, obey you when you say, you when you tell people, you guys got to quarantine for a few weeks. And uh, actually, the next slide, please. So this is a wonderful photo taken from Clooney's notebook that he actually has archived in uh, the medical school here. And you can see this little ship peeking out between the arches of the iceberg. And Clooney included a story with this photo. So at the age of about 22 or 23, uh, Clooney started volunteering with the Royal Mission to Deep Sea Fishermen. So he got to work with his idol, his early idol, Dr. Grenville. And uh, so you have this 22, 23 year old fresh doctor basically in charge of a hospital and caring for people in the Labrador area. And in 1902, Clooney gets married to his Montreal sweetheart, Eleonora Thompson and they moved back to Battle Harbor. And this image was, the story that goes along with this image is in uh, his boss, was, Dr. Grenfell was visiting. And Grenfell wanted to take a little boat, a jolly boat, and go between the, the arch. And Clooney says, well, like, well, I was a newly married man and Dr. Grenfell was a bachelor. So I didn't, kind of, didn't want to risk my life, you know, potentially having that, that iceberg fall apart. And so they did not do that little journey. And two days later, the, the iceberg arch actually did collapse. So uh, a bit of prudence on Dr. Clooney's part. So um, in 1904, uh, Clooney and his wife and their baby daughter re relocate to St. John's, where he starts his private medical practice. Um, next slide, please. And over the years, you know, Clooney establishes himself as a prominent doctor in town. And sometimes his exploits would make it into the news. So you have this story right here from the Evening Telegram, peculiar accident happened Saturday, where a woman tried to basically stop her two cows from fighting. She gets gored with a, with a horn, and Clooney is one of the doctors called on to heal her and then, you know, fix her up. Um, in 1914, uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a, a incident that happened in the spring of 1914 called the Sealing Disaster. Uh, it happened on the iceberg off the coast of Newfoundland when, a, when uh, 132 sealers were stranded overnight for two days and two nights during a blizzard, and 78 of these men died. And the, the survivors clinging to life were brought back to St. John, and Dr. Clooney was one of the doctors who uh, saw to be the these people who've been through something quite horrifying. You can see uh, Clooney is the not carrying the, the stretcher, but is um, standing off to the side. So finally, that was 1914, and we're in in the war years now. So I'll get. So I hope you guys have a, an idea of what type of person Clooney is at this point. So uh, 1914, um, war is declared in Europe, and Newfoundland was automatically at war as well. And the people were really eager to join in. Like many places, it was felt that the war would not be over, the war would be over quickly. And if you didn't sign up now, you would miss your chance for glory. But in Newfoundland, there was one complication. They did not have an army and there hadn't even been a military presence in the island since the 1870s. So uh, the government didn't even have a, like a department for war or anything. So the government formed a patriotic association that would manage the war effort and uh, no need to start an actual department and because it would be over by Christmas. And so it was managed by both politicians and volunteer members of the community. And of course, Clooney wanted to join in. Of course, he threw in his support for the war effort as in his capacity as a doctor. And he took up the role of, of evaluating potential recruits. 
remember, Newfoundland does not have an army, it has to build an army. And um, so how do you go about even starting determining who is available, who is eligible to be a, to be a part of this army? So Clooney decides that, okay, we don't know what the standards are and we don't have a military or military department, but we do have a Royal Naval Reserve. So Clooney goes to the doctor in charge of training those soldiers and asks for their recruitment guidelines. And so he starts using those, he and fellow doctors start using those to determine who will make up the first, first few soldiers of the regiment. And eventually they actually have to toss that, reg that those guidelines because it turns out the Navy guidelines were actually higher than the Army guidelines. So people who'd been initially turned away for not meeting the Navy guidelines could actually reapply and get in. So, um, and further complicating it is that they did not even have like uniforms or equipment and Clooney would actually go about in his, um, his St. John's amb ambulance uniform. Actually, uh, can we move to the next slide? I think we've stayed on that one too long. Yes, here we go. So you can see Clooney um, in the very center. He's the one standing tall with all the buttons down his shirt. And that was his uh, St. John's Ambulance Brigade uniform. Because in uh, a few years prior, he'd actually helped start a local branch of that organization. Um, and making up the, the first soldiers of the regiment were actually uh, were from paramilitary organizations. We may not have had an army here, but we did actually have paramilitary military organizations. So we had the Church Flag Brigade, the Methodist Guards, and uh, a number of others. And Clooney was a volunteer with the Methodist Brigade as well. And soldiers were actually trained um, in St. John's in an area called Pleasantville, as you can kind of see here. So the first contingents of soldiers became known as the first 500 or blue puttees for the blue leg wraps they had. And the of the blue puttees and the first 500 really dominate the discussions when people talk about Newfoundland and World War I. Um, so in October, uh, you know, the, it was decided, okay, the soldiers have had enough training, it's time to go across the Atlantic. But unfortunately, uh, Clooney was not with them. He really wanted to go across, so he spent so much time helping build the regiment, he spent time in Pleasantville, you know, certifying that they were fit, spending time there. But unfortunately, the governor of Newfoundland at the time held Clooney back. He believed if the Germans struck the city with a U-boat attack, uh, Clooney would, have, would be the one to lead the medical response. So in October, he had to watch his colleagues in the medical, uh, his medical colleagues go across without him. And actually, if you change the next slide, you will see this letter Clooney wrote no, that is, okay, I'll, I'll speak a bit about this, but if, this is Clooney walking with the first uh, 500 soldiers on their way to go onto the boat that would take them across the Atlantic, but he was not with them. But a medical bag of his was. So one of his colleagues, Dr. Wakefield, um, basically had rushed to St. John's when war broke out and had, hadn't brought any of his materials with him. And so Clooney lent him a bag. And if you go to the next slide, you will see this letter Clooney wrote basically asking the government to reimburse him because uh, the bag of equipment had been lost in Gallipoli and was worth about $100. So he was looking for his money back. All right, if you go to the next slide, please. Well, I don't, actually, that's a little too soon, uh, but I'll just talk anyway. So um, Clooney would get his chance to go overseas, obviously. And Clooney, in, speaking to the CBC in the 1960s, says, I wanted to go over with the first 500 to get things fixed, fixed up over on the other side. The governor wouldn't hear of me going because he was obsessed with the idea we would surely be attacked by some of these raiders, German raiders who were out. And I had to charge char char all medical ambulance arrangements and he wouldn't leave me. Let me leave, sorry. Um, but in March 1915, that changed. The governor called a meeting with Clooney and he said, because the, the harbor was filled with ice, you both wouldn't be able to, ta uh, to attack the town. And he gave Clooney permission to accompany, to accompany uh, Company D to Scotland, where the regiment was stationed. And Clooney was even told he could bring his wife, Eleonora, who was the treasurer of the Women's Patriots Association. So Clooney had finally gotten his wish to ship out. And so he had to you know, shut down his private medical practice, 
you know, pack all his medical equipment. So he spent his 36th birthday making travel arrangements, packing, making sure the kids were going to be taken care of by re relatives. And then he sailed onwards. Yeah, so one of the caveats that the governor had given Coney at the time was, you have to be back in two months time. And as we'll see, Clooney was, uh, he, he came back, he came back a bit more than uh, two months. He, he ended up, I think, spending about a year over, over in Europe. And um, from his notebooks, you can actually kind of read between the lines and get the impression that Clooney from the very start was looking for a way to drag out that two months. Um, and, and he certainly found it. He wanted to be closer to that action. And like so many of the young soldiers, he didn't want to miss out. So it's not quite uh, unusual that he, he was looking for something to get involved with. So uh, Clooney and his wife uh, go with Company D uh, and they arrive in Edinburgh uh, around March 30th, uh, where they hang out with the Newfoundland Regiment. So the Newfoundland Regiment, uh, it's you know, March of 1915 and they've been overseas since October. And they are not any closer to the action, but um, they're now actually garrisoning the Edinburgh Council, and they're the first non-Scottish troops to ever have done so, which uh, Clooney once said that his aunt, who was living in Scotland, would have been horrified <laughs> at the thought of, uh, you know, non-kilted soldiers um, having that honor. Oh, my. Uh, hmm. I'm sorry, I'm having a, a bit of a technical problem. I have to go turn uh, something on. I will be back in a second. So after the presentation today, we should have time for questions. So um, during this brief brief break, um, please feel free to type your questions into the chat and I can go through them at the end. If not, hold on to them and we'll have uh, a discussion, a lively discussion following uh, Beth's presentation. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I have my laptop plugged into an outlet and my computer just told me, hey, your battery is dying. Uh, you should plug it in. And so I think I had to do a few flip switch because the, the wiring of this house is a bit buggy. So sorry about that. Um, so anyway, where I was, the Clooney and his wife then are on to London and he gets a message from the governor with, two, with another request. He wants to head to France and see the base hospitals there which permission was granted and the McPherson's cross the channel. And this is where husband and wife depart. Eleanor heads to Paris where Cooney has an, an artist aunt living in the city. And McPherson and Cooney uh, goes to St. Omer. So, and this is where his story gets really interesting because he has two orders that enabled him to one inspect base hospitals on the French coast and a second order that said he was reported to the director of medical services at the Allied headquarters at the front, which means going to St. Omer. However, you know, Clooney wanted a bit of an adventure and to be closer to the action. So he actually disregards his first order. He does not go to the hospitals in France. He goes to St. Omer, which is a bit more in the north. And this is where he meets General Sir Arthur Sloggett, uh, director general of medical services in the field. And by this time, Clooney would have heard of the gas attack that had happened on April 22nd. So this is where our image here uh, comes into play. This isn't an image of the first gas attack. Uh, this was just one taken uh, at a later date, but it kind of does give a, a visual representation of what happened. So on April 22nd, 1915, um, the first large scale chemical attack uh, where Germany released 158 tons of pouring gas in the East Salient. And the targets were uh, French soldiers, uh, French Algerian soldiers, actually. And it said that 5,000 soldiers died and 2,000 were taken as prisoners of war. And a number of them were temporarily wounded. So it, it's good to understand uh, a little step back that World War I was sometimes called the Kenneth War. And it's not just because chemical weapons were introduced on a large, massive scale. But warfare in general had, you know, really industrialized and absolutely changed. Uh, you had a plane that were frequently used. They were mounted with guns. You had U-boats were now a new concern. Um, and chemical, chemicals were really useful in, you know, not only harming soldiers, but also making their lives more livable. Uh, you know, chlorine and other chemicals could be used to, you know, sanitize the latrine. 
So uh, in general, it is called the chemical war, not just because of chemical weapons being introduced. And when the Germans unleashed this chemical attack, um, it, um, it, it was a really controversial thing. And we think of chemical weapons, oh, that's horrible, that's terrible. But some would argue at the time that, well, you know, slicing someone in half with, or riddling them with bullets with what a machine gun would do is also horrible. But at the time, there were two conventions in The Hague that had prohibited chemical weapons. So while um, the British were absolutely condemning chemical use of chemical weapons, they were behind the scenes wondering, OK, can we make a, some chemical weapons of our own? And of course, when you have this new weapon, you have to figure out, well, how are we going to protect our soldiers from it? All right. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, I, I kind of want to talk about what, what chlorine gas did to you. And this is an entry from British Lance Sergeant Elmer Cotton from his diary on describing the effects of chlorine gas. It produces a flooding of the lungs. It is an equivalent death to drowning only on dry land. The effects are these, a splitting headache and terrific thirst. To drink water is instant death. Knife edge of pain in the lungs, the coughing up of greenish froth of the lungs and stomach, ending finally in insensibility and death. The color of the skin from which turns a greenish black or yellow, the tongue protrudes and the eyes assume a glassy stare. It is a fiendish way to die. And that is uh, you know, a soldier's experience in early May of chemical weapons. So when you have a weapon like this, well, basically chlorine, you breathe it in, chlorine gas, you breathe it in, and uh, the gas reacts with water in the lungs and it basically creates acid. And it is really a, a horrible, horrible way to die or, or even live. Uh, it's excruciatingly painful from not personal experience, but from every ent uh, entry that I've read about it. Two days after the first gas attack, of course, the Germans unleashed an encore on a nearby Canadian division. And you know, there are some ideas that this is chlorine gas and that you know, there are some ways to protect, it on, to protect from it. So uh, soldiers were told to get a damp handkerchief, wet it, put it to their face, um, even urinating on that handkerchief or socks and putting to the face was thought to protect against chlorine. Um, so obviously the, that is not going to be the way you want to protect your troops. So there was this concentrated effort to create some form of new protection. But uh, let's go back to, Saint, uh, to Clooney in St. Omer, where a place where he wasn't actually supposed to have gone to. So uh, Clooney meets General, Lieutenant General Sir Arthur Sloggett, who was not expecting Clooney. And uh, he basically told the, the Newfoundlander that he had, uh, you're not supposed to be here. And um, he said, he basically says, oh, that was a mistake, but you're here now. And so uh, Sloggett had this reputation of being very easygoing, which probably helped in Clooney's favor. Adding to Clooney's favor is that he had a letter from Sloggett's wife and from Lady Elizabeth Sloggett, who Clooney might have met through their shared association with the St. John's Ambulance uh, in, in London. So uh, she, had she had given Clooney a letter to hand to her husband. So um, Sloggett gives permission for Clooney to hang around for only a day or so, so Clooney can visit the convoy line of ambulances who are collecting the wounded and bringing them back to the nearest casualty clearing station. And the next day, Clooney does just that. But Clooney does not have any intention of going back to London. So um, this is where Clooney uh, inadvertently gets involved with the, the prototype race to create the gas mask or respirator, as they would say. So um, Clooney gets up the more, next morning at the hotel he's staying. He goes downstairs for breakfast. And already seated at the table are two gentlemen already in discussion about gas and what McPherson, and you know, from McPherson listening in, he basically deduces they were professors. And they are in fact Professor William Watson and Herbert Baker. And they are both professors at the Imperial, Imperial College of Science and Technology in London. And they are there on government orders to help determine the identity of the gas and any kind of protection that, could, they, that they could come up with. So um, they basically start chatting with Clooney saying, you know, what are you doing there? And he basically honestly says, like, I am just trying not to get sent back to base. He says he, he's keeping out of sight for fear of being sent back to base. So uh, he basically invites himself into the this research that's going on in town in St. Omer. The scientists have taken over a local school 
they set up a lab, including a sink chamber, which is just like a half quarter of a rung partitioned with a glass. So they, they can kind of flood with gas and, you know, figure out if a gas mask works. So uh, Clooney says, like, I would be a great guinea pig. When I was at mental physical school, I accidentally gassed myself with chlorine and lost my voice for a week. So uh, this is apparently good enough for them. And they say, come on, Clooney, let's go back to the lab down the road. And we're going to, like, figure out how to make a gas mask. So um, basically, the Allies had gone hold of a German-style respirator. It was just a pad soaked in some type of chemical, and that was held up to the face. So uh, the scientists in St. Omer decide, okay, we're going to recreate that. We're going to figure out what chemical that is that was used to cancel out the chlorine gas. But first, they decide, well, we need chlorine gas ourselves so we can kind of run an experiment. And Clooney volunteers that he will go back to London. He will go and find the chlorine gas and he will transport it back to them. So, um, and Clooney does just that. So he is technically, you know, obeying orders to go back to London. He is just coming back. And he, he, he was very well known for kind of twisting the words to get his own way. Um, so this, and Clooney writes about it in his notebook that this is actually kind of a, a very politically sensitive mission. So when the gas attack first happened, there were so much international condemnation towards the Germans for bringing in chemical weapons. They signed the Hague Declaration, so they shouldn't have been using gas. But the, the Germans would argue in part that, well, they weren't actually, they weren't the first people to use chemical weapons. The, the French had actually, so they were just retaliating. And, you know, historians actually debate if this was the case. Um, but I'm not going to touch that. But Clooney is, says he was sensitive to the idea that if he was caught transporting chlorine gas across the channel, then that would just be more propaganda for the Germans to say, well, you know, actually, you guys are also bringing in chlorine gas. His chlorine gas was being used, though, to uh, test uh, gas mass. So uh, Clooney, uh, you know, successfully brings his chlorine gas to back to St. Omer, and while he was gone, the scientists have, you know, come up with their own German style mask, face mask that just cover the nose and mouth, and they've uh, recreated the sodium bicarbonate solution, the hypo solution, uh, that they're going to dip their gas masks in and try out and see if they can actually protect themselves with chlorine gas, and it does not go according to plan. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is the hypo helmet that Clooney ends up creating. Uh, this is something, a photo I took back in like 2018 uh, is at the Imperial War Museum in London because they have a little tiny wing that is dedicated to chemical weapons. Uh, next slide. Uh, here it is. Okay, this is how uh, Clooney kind of talks about, you know, heading to the trench that they built outside of town to attempt to see if their masks work. So next morning with our chlorine and German pattern mask, Professor Watson and Baker with an officer and a few men went to some trenches outside town and donning the mask, we released some of the chlorine. The result was disastrous. Professor Watson was so badly gassed, he was taken to a Canadian hospital nearby. Professor Baker and I got more of them was comfortable into our lungs and our eyes were pretty sore. Uh, next slide. During the afternoon, I had recovered sufficiently to go to the hospital to see how Professor Watson was doing and also saw some of the bad casualty in hospital from the first enemy gas attack. Before leaving, I cut out a pattern in paper with my proposed helmet, producing my viola and mica, and persuaded the matron to sew it up for me and took it away with me. So uh, Clooney is visiting Watson and he gets the idea for a gas mask. He's already been kind of thinking about how the German style mask isn't really gonna cut it and they're not going to be able to really use it to protect their own soldiers. For one thing, it leaves the eyes completely exposed, which can lead to blindness or temporary blindness. So uh, Clooney um, basically surrounded by men who are coughing and hacking, who are been victims from the, the early gas attacks, basically has a matron like sew up his gas mask. Viola is, is the fabric he had and Micah is a lens. So. Uh, Clooney just puts him in his pocket and he goes on his merry way. So the next day they're back at the lab and they're trying to determine, okay, 
um, this, what gas mask are we going to use? What are we going to design? So Clooney reaches into his pocket and says, here. He doesn't say where he got the gas mask. It's just there. So an engineer puts it on and they enter a sealed chamber, chamber which is then flooded with chlorine gas. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, no, oh shoot. Okay, maybe I did not include this slide. Okay, uh, go back to that other slide. That's better than. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, this is how uh, Clooney describes uh, you know this gas mask being tested. When we were wondering what to try next, I pulled out my helmet, impregnated it with the solution, and said, "Try this." Colonel Harvey Re put it on and, expecting to be smothered, went into the chamber. Chlorine was released, and he pottered around for five minutes. And then grabbing it off, he started to ask why we were not releasing the gas. Unfortunately, I had a sprayer in my hand and immediately snatched the door open and threw a spray right over him, realizing his mistake. He dashed out and we closed the door. And um, basically, Harvey had been walking around the chamber. He hadn't noticed that the chamber had been flooded with chlorine. And so uh, he basically got fed up, like, why aren't we got, why aren't you guys releasing the chlorine? And took his helmet off, and then they had to spray him with the solution and get him out of there. So um, Clooney tells the story to kind of reiterate, like, his gas mask worked in a really, you know, surprising way. A lot of people had thought it would not work. They, they were kind of shocked about how well it worked. So, you know, uh, there's a, when people realized this, this gas mask worked, basically, as, as they hoped. Uh, they called the brass in, you know, the military leaders uh, who would give approval. And one of them is Loggett. And, you know, the scientists are saying, well, we don't know who came up with this gas mask. And Clooney kind of has to raise his hands and said it was his own design. And Loggett, you know, Loggett knows Clooney is not supposed to be there, that he's actually supposed to have been back in London for quite some time. But basically, he had the good luck of having contributed to something and being able to say my gas mask works and um he also says like okay slug it i yes i was supposed to be back in back in london but i hadn't been back to london i just came back with chlorine and uh clooney's helmet uh is typically called the hypo helmet taken from the the hypo solution it was doused in but in official orders it's called the british smoke helmet and about 2.5 million masks of his were made on his design, which saved countless lives. And uh, this is also Clooney's entrance into the, the chemist floor. Um, he, go, he basically then from there put in charge of uh, updating the gas mask, of getting it mass produced. And you know, um, they quickly the, the microfilm, people find it breaks too easily. So he goes on a journey to, to France to get a film that will actually, you know, not break it so easily. So um, basically, uh, his helmet, when we think of the hypo helmet, um, we think of that, you know, it's this fabric, there's this strip of, of film that they can see out of. But if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is actually uh, the PH helmet. And it has two round eyes, it has a little little kazoo mouth, as I call it, but it's a little tube. So sometimes it's called the tube helmet. And um, Clooney very much invented the hypo helmet, but the next iterations, the P helmet and the PH helmet and the PHG helmet, um, those were developed at Millbank. And Millbank was in London, and um, it was basically the Royal Army Medical Corps that were kind of trying to figure out, um, OK, we've nullified, neutralized the chlorine threat. As soon as they had a, a gas mask that could make it safe for soldiers to fight in chlorine gas, they knew the Germans were going to unleash a new chemical. And so they, there was this kind of, someone described as a kind of a chess match. You know, you would introduce one chemical, you would combat it with a gas mask, and they would just like, well, we're just going to give you a new chemical to fight. So, uh, so it's unclear exactly how involved Clooney was in the evolution of, the, of his hypo helmet. He helped improve it, but it's unclear of, you know, who suggested the little, the breathing mouth and who said, you know, these little eye holes should be rimmed with tin. But it just goes on to show that one of the benefits of Clooney's gas mask was that it was so flexible that you could update it. And all the while his gas mask is being updated, you also have the box respirator. And if you go to the next slide, you will see the box respirator. 
Yeah, so when people think of the gas mask, this is typically what they think of first. They don't think of the little hood that you had to tuck in over underneath your 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 um, jacket um, to keep it secure and without allowing you know chlorine gas to get in that way. Uh, the box respirator worked on really different principles. Clooney says he was involved in the very early stages of it, um, but he doesn't go into a lot of detail on it. Unfortunately, I would love to be a fly on the wall on that conversation on those experiments. But uh, the, the, the hypo helmet and the fabric baggy gas mask that he helped bring in um, basically worked on the principle of you're wearing a bag, you're, the bag gets soaked in a chemical, and the chemical neutralizes the threat of the, 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 the poisonous gas trying to kill you. Um, where the box respirator, uh, you have this fat box sitting on your chest, hence the name box respirator, and that's where the purification of air is going on, and you're breathing in you know, purified air. So uh, they're really, really different. They're very different gas masks and uh, Clooney probably shouldn't be, they, they just developed on, on different lines. So um, when people say he's the inventor of the gas mask, they often think of this one, that is not the case. Right, and I do actually wanna talk about um, some gas masks that didn't work. Uh, there was, uh, during around the same time that Clooney was involved in the gas mask race, there was a man named Charles Aiken at McGill University who came up with his own gas mask. And this was a facial covering with a metal tube that went from the person's mouth into the ground. And he tested it on the, the grounds of the university. And apparently it did work. The earth acted as a filter and provided uncontaminated air the soldiers could breathe through dur to, during a gas attack. However, it um, did not catch on for very obvious reasons. Soldiers just couldn't stand on the battlefield and catch the mud through the metal tube unable to walk. Um, Clooney was very aware of that. Clooney, there's no saying that signs that Clooney knew about this example. This, this example basically died where it started. But Clooney was aware that, you know, it, the gas mask couldn't just protect you. It had to be workable. It had to be something you could wear and walk around in. You had to be able to fight in it. It had to protect, you know, your mouth, your nose, your eyes. So, um, that's on. So um, next slide, please. Right on. So um, this is a this is a really nice sentence that Cooney wrote in his notebook. Uh, he was talking about a, a fellow chemist who'd been also involved in a Canadian chemist from Toronto named Naismith, and he said we both belong to a profession which does not um, register nor patent its discoveries, but gives them through freely to the cause of humanity. So this speaks to some of the questions people had. Why didn't Clooney patent his gas mask? And Clooney says, basically, that's not something doctors do. This is something he gave freely to the cause of humanity. But in truth, Clooney probably couldn't have gotten a patent for it. There were gas masks were not unusual. The idea that, you know, there's something toxic in the air and we need to protect ourselves from it through some kind of mechanical mean was not new. Like, Pliny the Elder had an idea for a gas mask that was like an animal bladder you held up to your face. Um, so, the, so the idea for a gas mask actually becomes a really interesting discussion that I had in my manuscript. Uh, in the 19th century, we see more um, masks for, you know, firefighters, for people deep diving. So Clooney really, his, his gas mask is very much specifically meant to be a gas mask for chemical warfare. And that's how I deal with that. Um, you also have an American inventor named Garrett Morgan who patented a gas mask that was kind of similar to Clooney's. It's a canvas hood that could be used in mines. Um, so the idea of this in, of inventor becomes really a, an interesting one to think about because you know if I Google Clooney, the like first inventor of the gas mask, I can find some sources. But you may come up with Garrett Morgan, the American inventor. You may come up with actually John Scott Haldane, who had an early respirator that the British used called the Black Veil respirator. So um, yeah. Um, anyway, for Cooney's uh, work in the war, he was made a companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George in 1918, and he retired with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, Cooney as a much more longer story in the war. Uh, it's filled with ups and downs, dysentery, uh, <laughs> and uh, being thrown from a horse and stomped on. Uh, a few uh, and and a few other adventures with chemical weapons. 
uh, he was eventually, you know, uh, sent out to uh, teach chemical uh, gas mask etiquette, basically how to put on your gas mask properly. You could give people gas masks, but they didn't necessarily know how to wear it. Uh, there's one case of a man basically going about his day and being, then hearing the gas alarm that warned soldiers that there was a potential gas attack underway. And he just throws on his helmet, or his hood, and just goes about and his superior officer has to run and catch him and wrap him in a jacket because your your gas mask actually had to be tucked into your chest and with through over your hood over your your jacket to actually be effective and you know not allow chlorine gas into you. So the idea that you actually had to train soldiers to use their gas mask, including became a part of that as well. And he was sent to Gallipoli, um, Italy, uh, and he was actually almost on his way to Romania, but that didn't happen. Um, so unfortunately, I do not have a book to push right now. I've been researching Clooney's life for about five years now. Uh, he did survive uh, the war and he became a prominent doctor in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, he served as secretary, treasurer and register for the Newfoundland Medical Society. He was involved with various health reform measures and even set up a TV camp on family owned land. He was chairman of the Lunacy Commission, president of the St. John's Ambulance Council and vice president of the Newfoundland Division of the Canadian Law. Red Cross Society. Um, he was a member of the Medical Council of Canada uh, and he became its president in 1954. And uh, he was also appointed a Knight of the British Order of St. John of Jerusalem and a Knight of Justice. Uh, if you go uh, next slide, please. Yeah, yeah there, um, this is one of my favorite photos of Clooney, uh, probably before a horse stomped on him and ended his uh, interesting military career. Um, I don't actually have a date for it. It's either 1915 or 1916. His, um, this was probably before he was injured. Um, so it might have been really early 1916. Uh, next image, please. Right on. So um, Clooney died at his home at the age of 87 and is buried in a family plot in the west end of St. John's at the General Protestant Cemetery. Um, the only allusion to his wartime service is a Maltese cross you can kind of see at the very top. But yeah, so there we have it. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about my sources. Um, most of the photos on the screen were courtesy of the Romans, which is the Provincial Archives in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, I also used clips from Clooney McPherson's notebooks, which have been digitized, and you can, guys can all go read up on yourselves. It's held by the Memorial University Medical School Founder Archive. Um, they're all digitized, and you can also make an appointment to go see them in person if you like, and if you're in St. John's. Uh, some of the photos were taken by me, like the Clooney's uh, grave monument, uh, as well as the photos of the Imperial War Museum. Um, I have a habit of, whenever I travel, trying to find a Clooney McPherson gas mask. There are two currently in St. John's, one held by the room, the other one is held by the medical school, and the other one I found is the Imperial War Museum. Um, thank you so much to the Clan McPherson Museum for letting me give this chat, and I also have to thank the Arsenal for giving me money to do my early research. Yes, um, if you go to the next slide, please. There we go. There we go. So um, if anyone has actually heard any stories of Dr. Clooney McPherson they'd like to share with me, uh, please reach out. Um, I recently found out that my one of our family neighbors who was a doctor, when he went to register as a doctor here because he's originally from Egypt, the, the register at the medical association was Clooney. And one of my dad's friends actually told us that he was uh, delivered by Clooney. Uh, Clooney was the, the delivering doctor. And um, Yes, and if you want to find updates on how the book is coming and when it's coming out, uh, you can find me on social media. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, shall I stop sharing the presentation now? Yes, yeah. Wonderful. Okay, great. Now I can now I can see everyone. Um, what a what a wonderful uh presentation. I'm I'm struck by the fact that McPherson's have a very long and distinguished uh, history of, of feats of bravery uh, or strategic success in war, but it's it's interesting and, and heartening to know that we also have um, a humanitarian uh, successes and achievements um, through what, what Clooney did. Um, I do have a question just to get things started. Were, were the Germans at the same time developing uh, a gas mask to 
uh, assist on the battlefield, knowing that winds could shift very quickly and, you know, their own offensives could, could suddenly turn back on them. <laughs> yes, uh, they absolutely were developing their own gas masks. And it's really interesting that they, the British were kind of like more haphazard almost. Not, not ha haphazard is definitely the wrong word. Um, the Germans were really top down. So their chemical weapons offensive was completely led by a man named Fritz Haber, who's known as the father of modern chemical weapons and a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry for the Haber-Bosch method. So a uh, duality of man, I suppose. He, you know, is the reason why we can, you know, we, we're not starving today because, you know, the ammonia process for fertilization. And, but also he can use that to make explosives and he invented the he was a big proponent of chemical weapons. Um, the, the Germans were absolutely developing their own chemical weapons, uh, their own gas masks, but they were they were quite different. Uh, they often were really focused on like rubber, which could be a problem because if you ran out of rubber. Uh, but so the 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 Allies, the British, were really using cloth masks. Sure, sure. It was only I, I, remembering back to my um, institutional research training. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was going through my, my doctoral studies, um, human subject testing is so highly oh. restrictive, um, but didn't happen until after the Second World War. And you can yes. see that here, where I, I don't know that today I'd volunteer to walk into a sealed chamber full of yeah. chemical well, gas. Well, that's so interesting because, you know, some of the men, the doctors and the scientists who were involved in this early chemical gas research, um, you know, I, I'm thinking of Edward Harrison, a lot of them were, they were older, they had scientific degrees, but they really, really wanted to be soldiers. And they were actually, and I'm thinking of Moet Jones too. Um, and so they were actually plucked out of their military service and said, actually, you are going to go and use your chemical knowledge to help develop gas masks. So I think a lot of them actually started thinking of it as, as, a, as their military service that, okay, these young men, they're in Europe, they're in the trenches, they're fighting for their lives. And we're also in a battle too, we're in the scientific battle. So we're gonna put our bodies on the line, our health on the line and safety on the line. And we're going to try and advance the safety of the soldiers by risking our own selves. Yeah, uh, I actually have a book called Who Goes First? And it is about the history of scientists and doctors experimenting on themselves. There's actually a really long history of scientists doing that. Because, you know, why would you ask someone else to do something you weren't willing to do? And it's actually a bit more ethical when you think about the scientists in World War I thinking, I'm going to test this on myself. Rather than just, you know, they could have easily have pointed you, random soldier, put on the gas mask and go in this, rather than, you know, using your colleagues. Right now, and in, in, incredibly brave, incredibly yeah. brave. I wonder if I can uh, impose upon Ewan McPherson here, because... Uh, he, he's our, our resident historian and, and uh, recently published his own book on uh, McPherson uh, history throughout the ages. And uh, Ewan, I wonder if you have any stories to share with Beth uh, that she may not have heard before. Um, and certainly this can be taken in an online format, but you're always good for an anecdote. Uh, oh, I think you're muted, sir. Thank you. Um, no, my, my own close connection, I suppose, to Dr. Clooney would be, um, oh goodness, his name escapes me now, and he was editor of Craig Do for a short time. Um, Harvey McPherson uh, Webb. And, and um, actually, he... He assumed the name McPherson uh, f from his uh, grandfather, Dr. Clooney. Beg your pardon, his uncle, Dr. Clooney. Um, and my memory of, of him is in the Clam Museum in what is now the Archive Centre, which you're familiar with. Well, and, and he would sit there and um, use it as an office whilst he was the editor of Craig Do. And I don't know if he got on too well with you and that's EOI and you and the curator, I'm not sure about that. And he didn't live too far away down towards the railway station. So I've got no direct, no direct connection with Dr. Clooney, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. but, but certainly with his, um, his nephew, Harvey. 
who, who was something something of a great character. Was, um, that, was that Archibald McPherson's son? Ashram, no, it wouldn't be. It, it, it was a, a sister. Oh, Ava. I think it was Eva. Eva, because she married twice. Uh, she married, a, she went over to London, I think, in 1910 ish. Mary is staying with some of their, their maternal relations and married the son in that family. They had three children. He actually served as a doctor in the war, and he unfortunately was killed by, I think, a shell in France. And she remarried another doctor named Young, and they had one doctor, uh, one daughter, sorry. Right. So, yes, no, yeah. no, I think it was Eva. I, yes. I haven't, yeah. I, I say yeah. I haven't checked, but Harvey assumed the name McPherson and, 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 and dropped his, his birth name. He took his, took his mother's name. And he was quite well known for telling stories. Um, one should always be careful what to say, I suppose, but perhaps didn't let the truth get in the way of a good story, which, which is one way, one way of putting it. Uh, and, and we've cert we've certainly got a, um, a snuff mull in the Clam Museum that, that belonged to Harvey, who he said had been given to him by Dr. Clooney, and that snuff mill is there today. Um, and I, I passed it on to Dr. Alan G. McPherson, our clan historian, and I think his son Ewan is, is watching it. I'm, I may be wrong this evening. Um, and Alan was doubtful about the story of, of uh, that Harvey had given regarding the background of the snuff, bill, snuff mill, which apparently had belonged to Robert Burns at one time. And given and given way back in Alexander McPherson's time, Alexander being the great 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 grandfather, two or three times great. Yeah, it's um, Alexander, Peter, another Peter. Peter. Yes. There's two Peters, two Peters. Peter, That's the right. second the second Peter had a son named Campbell, and then there's Clooney. And then Clooney yeah. had a son named Campbell, and he went on to become the third lieutenant gov uh, governor. We kind of governor of Newfoundland Labrador when we became and, and there was confusion because it, it revolves around the, the area of Greenock. Yeah. Where they, where they came from. And another list, little um, interesting background, I think, is that it's believed they came from the Hebrides before Greenock. Now, if they came from the Hebrides, then it's quite possible they were Sky McPhersons and not Badenoch McPhersons. But that's speculation, of course. But it's just, it, it is said that it is believed that they were from the Hebrides. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if Ewan has got anything further to say. The, the other Ewan, I think, who, who's there. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I can't. Hello, Ewan. Hello, Hello, Ewan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't add anything to that, but. Um, I just so my favorite story about Dr. Clooney is uh, you're probably familiar with this Elizabeth because it's in his notebooks the story of him meeting Alexander Graham Bell on the train as he's going to medical school yes. and Bell tells him this incredible story about this the portrait story, that portrait. yeah so it's very it's quite complicated but uh, it's in his notebooks and uh, he also has an article in an early issue of Craig Do describing this whole scenario with this portrait blowing across the Atlantic. It's yeah. really amazing. <laughs> yeah, like, it, you got to take a grain of salt with Clooney, I think, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but that is a great story. So to kind of clue in other people, um, Clooney's grandfather, Peter, was a young man when he met Melville Bell, the father of Alexander Grand Bell. And as young men, so the, the senior Bell was sent to St. John's basically to get clean air away from like the, the industrialized Edinburgh, I think. And so the McPherson, Peter McPherson, including his grandfather, becomes really good friends with Melville. And the family story goes that uh, Peter actually saved Bell's life because his leg got tangled in the water on Kitty Vitty Lake and he almost drowned. And so in the 1890s, when Alexander Graham Bell is visiting St. John's, Newfoundland, he stops in at uh, the McPherson residence when Clooney's a young boy. 
And so Clooney has these memories of meeting Belle and his wife and I think the finger bell. And so Clooney, when he's a young medical student, he has to leave Newfoundland and go to mainland Canada, a different country at the time. And he's taking the train and they're just out of Truro, which is a town outside of Halifax. And that's where the line joins, where the little tiny community where Alexander Granville had a, a massive residence. And that's where they meet. Oh, how interesting. Yeah, I, I can already see. So Elizabeth, we have a uh, gathering every year in August. Uh, mm -hmm. First weekend of I, I feel like you must come over because uh, I think you and you and and you and with an A uh, will uh, <laughs> should should you and with an A decide to come, um, we'll have a, a very robust conversation about this sort of this sort of thing. Um, we did have a question in the chat from Allison, um, just asking about Clooney's nationality. I, I have a follow up to that. I, I did say that she was that he was uh, Canadian, but did he consider himself to be a Canadian, or was he more um, yeah. Newfoundland's Labrador? Uh, it, was that his identity? Yeah. Right on. So Clooney was born in 1879. And so that means he's a Newfoundlander. His birth certificate says he's a Newfoundlander. When he leaves, he, when he leaves the island and isn't in Labrador, he's in another country. And so uh, I think later on, uh, he basically makes peace with being a Canadian. He, he has this letter in 1950, mid-1950, he said, when he's talking to a, a family friend, and he says, in 1949, Newfoundland all willy-nilly, willy-nilly, became a Canadian province. So from that, I can kind of glean that maybe he wasn't pro-Confederation. So he grew up in a really tumultuous time in Newfoundland. So in, in, after the World War, Newfoundland's economy was in shatters. We'd lost 91% uh, of the regiments had been wiped out in the Battle of Beaumont Hamill, which is one of the, it's, when people talk about World War I in Newfoundland, they're just talking about the trauma and tragedy of 91% of your battalion of uh, being wiped out in 30 minutes and over uh, during the big push of the Battle of the Somme. So um, anyway, so in, in the 1930s, Newfoundland actually defense democracy. We stopped voting for our government and we have a, what's called commission of government. And so six delegates appointed by the British are basically ruling and making every decision, economic decision about our prop, or, of our country. And then in the 1940s, the question becomes, okay, are we gonna get responsible government back? Are we going to go join the United States in an economic union? A political party actually formed to debate that and push for it. It went nowhere. And then the next option was, well, what about Canada? Do we join Canada? And in 1949, we had a vote and with a margin, we voted to join Canada. So Newfoundland and Labrador became the 10th Canadian province. And um, Clooney never, I don't, haven't seen any writing Clooney coming out swinging strong against responsible government or confederation or let's join the United States. Um, but I can kind of insinuate something. He was one from St. John. He was wealthy. Uh, he was from St. Wealthy person in St. John. Um, so he was probably pro responsible government, but he wasn't going to be hurt if he jo we joined Canada. So I think, you know, he. He joined when he became Canadian. I think he wanted to avail of the, the possibilities of being Canadian. And he did go on to become the president of the, the Canadian Medical Association. And fun fact, he was the second Newfoundlander to be the president of the Canadian Medical Association. Um, one of the reasons why a lot of Newfoundlanders went to McGill Medical School and not Dalhousie in the 18, 1890s era, because a Newfoundlander was actually the dean of the medical school. His name was Sir Thomas Roddick. And Roddick was a, another idol of Clooney. And he was actually the doctor who really pushed for Listerism, like antiseptic theory, um, that you know, operating theaters should maybe be clean and maybe we should like disinfect everything we can and wash up. And he was, Roddick was a really big proponent of it and really pushed to bring it into McGill and, and Canada. So Roddick was actually the first Newfoundlander to become the head of the Canadian Medical Association. So um, long story short, I think he like made peace with being Canadian and, and enjoyed it in the end. Amazing, you're, you're a wealth of knowledge in these areas. I wonder, um, so you're, you're writing this, this book. Yeah. Um, is there a date for publication or how far out are, are we looking? <laughs> um, I've been doing this 
for five years. Don't judge me, please. <laughs> I've been Not working as a full, I've been working as a full time reporter under a pandemic, so I couldn't even get into archives for a little bit. Like I couldn't even get into the medical school archives for like over a year. I was supposed to take off a week in March 2020, and I was going to do an archive dive locally at the medical school, and then the pandemic happened, and I couldn't get into like last summer. <laughs> um, I'm about 75 percent of the book done. done. Um, there's a few archive materials I would really like to have that are in London in the um, the National Archives in Kew. Like there's a uh, the first autopsy report of someone who died from like chlorine gas. I really want to get my hands on it, um, but that means going for a trip and uh, travel's a bit tri tricky right now and pricey. So I have to apply for arts grants to do it. But um, I'm hoping I'm 75% done. And uh, then I can start trying to find a publisher. I really want to go with one of the big five publishers, one of the big ones, because I think this is not just a Newfoundland story. Because um, he's a Newfoundlander, so you know we often think, oh, it's a, it's, it should be lo published locally here, which is which would be nice. But it's also a story that has like national importance and touches on World War One. So, and I've also recently signed a contract to write another book, <laughs> as I had in my little, uh, as Bo mentioned in the intro, I, I've recently signed a contract to write a book about the history of comic books in Newfoundland and Labrador. So uh, that is a book I actually have to deliver on it by March. So I'm just juggling these two books and my freelance writing as a reporter here. Absolutely. We have to keep us up to date on your progress. Um, I'm sure we'd all be very interested to, to read it when it comes out. Um, are there any questions in the last few minutes uh, before we sign off from anyone in the audience? Uh, feel free to throw it into the chat or raise your hand in the old fashioned way. Morgan has just put in, she very much enjoyed the, the uh, presentation and I think she her sentiments are reflected by us all, or echoed by us all. Um, so thank you so much, Elizabeth. This was this was really wonderful. Thank you, everyone who has attended. Um, this is a monthly occurrence. We do have a, a meeting with a, a talk uh, host every um, Saturday at the end of the month. Um, although I believe next week's might be a week early, um, and that will concern genealogy and, and researching family history. So. Um, spread the word, tell your friends. Um, again, this was a phenomenal presentation uh, and uh, we, we wish you the best of luck as you complete the remaining 25% of this, this fabulous book. Thank you, pleasure. Have a lovely <laughs> evening, everyone. A lovely afternoon and morning, wherever you may be. And, and we'll, we'll meet again next, next month. Right. Thank you, Paul. Bye -bye. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye.